the neuromuscular connection, the motor unit. The soma of lower motor neurons are at the brain stem and the spinal cord. We will refer to the lower motor neurons as motor neurons unless otherwise noted. Lower motor neurons are also called alpha motor neurons. There are also upper motor neurons, and those are the ones that are in your motor cortex in your brain, and those are the ones that guide voluntary actions of your muscles. And these are synapsing the upper motor neurons with the lower motor neurons, which are also called the alpha motor neurons. But we're, since we're only interested in these lower motor neurons from this point on, and in this, in this study guide, we're just going to refer to them as motor neurons. Each motor neuron makes a synaptic connection with a collection of muscle cells. Or put differently, a motor neuron innervates a collection of myocytes. Now myocytes are just the technical name for muscle cells. This collection of a neuron and the myocytes it innervates is called a motor unit. All motor units in a particular muscle are called a motor pool. So a single motor neuron can synapse with multiple myocytes. And that collection of a neuron, a single neuron, and the myocytes it innervates is called a motor unit. Now in a muscle, like a bicep or some other muscle, the collection of all these motor units is called a motor pool. Motor units come in different sizes. Small motor units, where a motor neuron innervates a smaller number of myocytes, where in a large motor unit, a motor neuron is innervating a large number of myocytes. Thus, the activation of a small motor units in a muscle will lead to a smaller force being generated, where activation of a large motor units in the same muscle will lead to the generation of a larger force. Activation of a neuromuscular junction. A motor neuron forms synaptic connections with myocytes. So instead of the synaptic connection being with the other neuron, a neuron will synapse with its effector cell. In the case of a motor neuron, the effector cell is the muscle cell, the myocyte. When an action potential arrives at the presynaptic membrane, voltage-gated calcium channels at the presynaptic membrane open, calcium flows into the axon bulb, the increase in calcium concentrations in the axon bulb causes preformed vesicles containing acetylcholine to fuse with the presynaptic membrane and release acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft. Now, this is no different than what we talked about before. Instead, what is happening is that the neurotransmitter that is being released is going to be acetylcholine. So you have acetylcholine filled vesicles within the axon bulb. Once the membrane is depolarized, the presynaptic membrane, you have voltage-gated calcium channels that open. Calcium flows down its electrochemical gradient into the axon bulb, increasing calcium concentrations within the axon bulb, and that leads to the release of acetylcholine through the fusion of those acetylcholine vesicles with the presynaptic membrane. Now acetylcholine binds to acetylcholine receptors on the end plate, the postsynaptic membrane. Now this word end plate is just a special term that is given to the postsynaptic membrane when the postsynaptic membrane is the membrane of a muscle cell. Acetylcholine receptors on myocytes are also referred to as nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. Acetylcholine receptors are ligand-gated cation channels. Upon binding acetylcholine, they will go to the open state and largely conduct sodium across the end plate into the myocyte causing end plate depolarization. An EPSP, or an end plate potential, so these are similar terms. End plate potential is a type of EPSP. It's just a type of EPSP that only happens on a myocyte's membrane. There are also voltage-gated sodium channels on myocyte membranes, which will open due to this depolarization event and thus acting as a positive feedback loop. Through the activation of acetylcholine receptors and the positive feedback loop by voltage-gated sodium channels on the end plate, the end plate is depolarized. If the initial depolarization caused by opening of acetylcholine receptors is strong enough, more voltage-gated sodium channels will open, and the nearby patches of membrane will be depolarized also, which will lead to further opening of voltage-gated sodium channels, somewhat akin to an action potential rippling across the myocyte membrane. So this is a positive feedback loop where if there is enough acetylcholine in the synaptic cleft, and you have enough acetylcholine receptors activated, where they go to the open position, and they allow sodium, mostly, to cross the myocyte membrane. 
and you have that initial depolarization event, the voltage-gated sodium channels that are on that plate, that membrane, will start to also open. These are not the same voltage-gated sodium channels that we talked about on the axon membrane. These are simple voltage-gated sodium channels that have two positions, open and close, and they will go to the open position when the membrane is depolarized. So if there's enough depolarization because of the acetylcholine receptors being activated, then you have more voltage-gated sodium channels opening, and it will stay in that open position as long as the membrane is depolarized. Now, the depolarization of the end plate will lead to voltage-gated calcium channels, which reside on the end plate to open. These voltage-gated calcium channels in myocyte membranes are in the transverse tubules, and we'll take a look at that shortly, T-tubules, and are physically linked to calcium release channels on the sacroplasmic reticulum. Now, just remembering that the sacroplasmic reticulum is what the ER, the endoplasmic reticulum, in a muscle cell, a myocyte, is called. And remembering that the ER and the SR contain a high concentration of calcium, much higher than what you have in the cytosol. So the opening of the voltage-gated calcium channels and the opening of the calcium release channels on the SR will lead to calcium moving down its electrochemical gradient into the cytosol. So in the case of the voltage-gated calcium channels, calcium will flow from extracellular into the cytosol, whereas in the case of the calcium release channels, calcium will move from the lumen of the SR into the cytosol. A cytosolic increase in calcium concentrations will occur because of these actions of these two channels, the voltage-gated calcium channels and the calcium release channels. An increase in cytosolic concentration leads to muscle contraction. Now we have a picture here showing all of this, and we have our presynaptic membrane here, and we'll highlight it in green. So this is our presynaptic membrane, and here's our end plate, our postsynaptic membrane in red. And you can see that in this case right here on the left, since the voltage-gated calcium channels are in the closed position, we know that the action potential has not been received yet. It has not arrived. So the membrane is at resting potential. Over here on the right, the action potential has arrived. The membrane has become depolarized. The voltage-gated calcium channels in the presynaptic membrane have opened. Calcium has come in, and that has led to an increase in calcium concentrations in the axonic bulb right here. And that leads to the fusion of the vesicle containing acetylcholine with the presynaptic membrane and the release of acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft here. Now, acetylcholine will bind to acetylcholine receptors, which are ligand-gated channels, on the end plate of the myocyte, and that will lead to mostly sodium being conducted across as those acetylcholine receptors go to the open position. As sodium comes in, the postsynaptic membrane, or the end plate, will become depolarized, and that will lead to these voltage-gated sodium channels also opening here and sodium coming in. This is a positive feedback loop. As sodium comes in, you have more depolarization. What you have is these voltage-gated calcium channels opening, but these voltage-gated calcium channels are attached to calcium release channels on the SR, and this is the SR right here, and that will lead to calcium coming in in both directions into the cytosol. So what you have is an increase in calcium concentrations in the cytosol. Once you have increased calcium concentrations in the cytosol, that will lead to muscle contraction. So we can write this out in this way. So we have an action potential, which arrives at the presynaptic membrane, which leads to depolarization of the presynaptic membrane. This leads to the activation of voltage-gated calcium channels, and activation of voltage-gated calcium channels just means that they will go to the open position. Again, these are on the presynaptic membrane also. And this will lead to acetylcholine release into the synaptic cleft. And acetylcholine, will just write ACH for acetylcholine, and this will be in the synaptic cleft. Now ACH, or acetylcholine, will activate the acetylcholine receptors. And this is on the end plate, or the postsynaptic membrane. This will lead to depolarization of the end plate, and this depolarization will activate voltage-gated sodium channels. And of course, these are on the end plate also. Again, the end plate is the postsynaptic membrane. I'm just not writing it in here. And these voltage-gated sodium channels are a positive feedback loop on depolarization. 
this depolarization will lead to voltage gated calcium channels to be activated which means they will move to the open position but this will also lead to again this is on the end plate also this will lead to at the same time the opening of calcium release channels and these are on the SR membrane this and this both will lead to calcium release or increasing calcium concentration within the cytosol and this will lead to muscle contraction and that's basically it how a muscle contracts now as important as it is on how a muscle contracts or how a system is activated it's also important to note how it is deactivated after each action potential arrives at the presynaptic membrane the system has to reset back to basal levels and then be ready for the next action potential. Otherwise, the muscle will stay in the contracted position. So resetting of a neuromuscular connection or junction after activation. The presynaptic membrane is repolarized by voltage-gated potassium channels and these are our voltage-gated potassium channels that are normally involved in an action potential. And we can just draw out an action potential here real quick. And our action potential looks something like this. And our voltage-gated potassium channels start to work basically in this area right here, right? And repolarize the membrane. The repolarization of the presynaptic membrane leads to voltage-gated calcium channels on the presynaptic membrane to close. So let's go back to our drawing. Once the action potential is gone, well, this is gone, right? So you're, the membrane is no longer depolarized. And if the membrane is no longer depolarized, then this arrow is gone and the voltage-gated calcium channels are not activated. The process which removes calcium from the axon bulb is always active and calcium concentration is immediately lower to pre-activation levels. We have to remember that calcium is always being removed from the cell. So when voltage-gated uh, calcium channels do open, calcium concentrations within the cytosol of the axon bulb increase but the increase in calcium concentration, in this case when the voltage-gated calcium channel is open, is outpacing the removal process of calcium. So what happens is calcium concentrations in the cytosol of the axon bulb spike. And that leads to acetylcholine vesicles to go ahead and fuse with the presynaptic membrane. So once this arrow that we had here is gone and the voltage-gated calcium channels are closed, then no longer calcium is coming into the cytosol. So I can actually draw it a little bit better down here. So voltage-gated calcium channels, when they open, this leads to, and we're going to put an activation arrow here, this leads to calcium concentrations increasing within the cytosol. This removal process is always active. What is that removal process? Sodium calcium exchangers that we talked about previously. These are the antiporters that bring sodium in with its gradient and remove calcium from the cytosol back into the extracellular environment against its gradient. So this is sort of a negative feedback right here on this, right? Then you have another one, and the other one is you have the calcium ATPase, which is a pump on the SR or the ER. And what this pump does, it removes calcium, moves it from the cytosol back into the ER against its gradient, thus decreasing calcium concentrations in the cytosol. And let me just put cytosol up here so that we're super clear of what we're talking about. So if this arrow is gone, and then of course this leads to this arrow being gone, the only thing that's working are these negative feedbacks on calcium concentrations within the cytosol and calcium concentrations within the cytosol immediately crash because the only thing active is the removal process. The removal process is never deactivated. Therefore, acetylcholine filled vesicles will no longer fuse with the presynaptic membrane. So this means that this arrow is gone. Okay, so no longer are you going to have acetylcholine being released into the synaptic cleft. Acetylcholine concentrations in the synaptic cleft are lowered by the actions of acetylcholine esterase, an enzyme which catalyzes the hydrolysis of acetylcholine 
Acetylcholine esterase is always in the synaptic cleft and active. When neuromuscular connection is activated, the release of acetylcholine outpaces acetylcholine esterase hydrolyzation of acetylcholine, thus acetylcholine concentrations in the synaptic cleft increase. So what we hadn't drawn in this picture was this negative feedback here about acetylcholine esterase. And what acetylcholine esterase does, it breaks down acetylcholine. It's a hydrolysis reaction where it breaks down acetylcholine. So if this arrow right here is no longer here, because when this is active and you're releasing acetylcholine, the release of acetylcholine will outpace the activity of acetylcholine esterase. Thus, you're going to have an increase in acetylcholine concentrations in the synaptic cleft. But when this arrow is gone and you're no longer releasing acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft, the only thing active is acetylcholine esterase, and that will go ahead and break down the acetylcholine very quickly in the synaptic cleft, thus crashing acetylcholine's concentrations in the synaptic cleft. There's also the activity of the sodium-driven co-transporters, which remove acetylcholine from that space also, but we're just going to concentrate on acetylcholine esterase because that seems to be the main component of the removal process of acetylcholine from these motor junctions. Lowering the concentration of acetylcholine leads to the inactivation of acetylcholine receptors. This arrow is gone. And acetylcholine receptors are no longer active. The end plate potential is set back to its resting potential. So what will happen is because acetylcholine receptors are no longer active, meaning they're no longer in open position and mostly sodium is not being moved from the extracellular into the cytosol, which leads to depolarization. So this arrow is gone. Once that depolarization event is gone, then voltage-gated sodium channels are going to start going to the closed position because the membrane is going to start moving toward resting potential, so this positive feedback loop is gone. So depolarization starts to go away as the membrane is reset back to resting potential. Voltage-gated calcium channels in the T-tubule is closed, which leads to calcium release channels on the SR closing. Therefore, calcium is no longer entering the cytosol of the myocytes. So with not having any depolarization, what you have is this is gone. Voltage-gated calcium channels are no longer opening. And they go to the closed position. And therefore, calcium release channels go to the closed position. And you're not going to have a release of calcium into the cytosol. And now we're left with the calcium that is already present because of the opening of these channels. Just like what we had below here, the same thing will happen because these things are active, these removal processes, you have the calcium ATPase on the SR and you have the sodium calcium exchanger on the end plate and they are always active and they are removing the calcium from the cytosol. So since calcium is not being released, the only thing left is the cleanup process, the process which removes calcium, and calcium concentrations will crash. And of course, if calcium concentrations crash, the signal to contract the muscle is gone. The strength of a skeletal muscle contraction. The strength of a muscle contraction is not due to the amplitude of the calcium concentration spike in the cytosol of a myocyte, but the frequency of these isolations. Now it's very important that we're talking about spike. What we mean by that is because of the electrochemical gradient for calcium is so strong pointing both from extracellular into the cytosol and also from the SR lumen into the cytosol, upon opening the voltage-gated calcium channels and the calcium release channels, what will happen is calcium concentrations in the cytosol will immediately increase. But once they close, they will immediately crash because the removal process is very fast also. And what we mean by the strength is not due to the amplitude, we mean that the muscle contraction, the strength of the muscle contraction is not dependent on how high the calcium concentrations go. Once you reach a certain level, the muscle will contract fully. So let's read this sentence again. The strength of a muscle contraction is not due to the amplitude of the calcium concentration spike in the cytosol of the myocyte, but the frequency of these isolations. So again, we're getting back to the mirroring of action potential frequency from the neuron to release of neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft and the calcium spikes 
that are seen within the effector cell, in this case being the myocyte. So if we were to draw this out, it would look something like this. And we've drawn something similar before, right? Where we had x-axis be time, and we can start out with millivolts membrane potential, and we have action potentials, right? And they look something like this. And at each time that an action potential arrives at the presynaptic membrane, you have, and we'll have our other y-axis be, in this case, concentration of acetylcholine in the synaptic cleft, what you have is a spike in the synaptic cleft of the neurotransmitter. And between action potentials, you have the cleaning up or the removal of the neurotransmitter from the synaptic cleft. And when the next action potential arrives, again, you get another spike. When the next one comes in, you have another spike. Now, when we're looking at calcium concentrations in the cytosol, and we can have another y-axis here, and this would be calcium concentrations, cytosol, of the muscle cell, what you'll see that well, calcium concentrations also mirror this. They go up, they come down, they go up, they come down, they go up, and they come down. Now, time-wise, they might be a little bit offset from each other in like millisecond time, but I've drawn them so that they're on top of each other. It is important to note here that this is the case with all cellular signaling systems involving calcium. The picture below is highlighting the relationship between hormone, vasopressin, concentration, and frequency of cytosolic calcium spikes. So before we even move on, any time calcium concentrations increase in the cytosol of a cell, there will be a response by that cell. Depending on the cell type, you will get a different response. In the case of muscle cells, you get muscle contraction. And here is a different system that also leads to calcium concentration spikes within the cell. So in this case, this hormone, you can see right here, vasopressin, and at different concentrations, 0.4 nanomolarity, 0.6, and 0.9. So you're increasing the concentration going in this direction. Okay? And you can see that you have a higher frequency of calcium spikes as the concentration of the hormone increases. The concentration of the hormone that the cell is being exposed to. At much higher levels of hormone here, you can see that the calcium spikes are very close to each other. But you can see that you have this sort of basal level of calcium right here. Then you have these spikes where they increase threefold because this is a near 200 nanomolarity right here and you're almost above 600 nanomolarity at the height of these spikes. The amplitude is not deciding. As you can see, the amplitude at higher hormone concentrations is about the same as at lower concentrations of the hormone. But you can see that within a time window, if I have equivalent time windows, you can see that you have more spikes in those equivalent time windows because this is a time in minutes right here, down here, okay? An increased extracellular vasopressin is a stronger signal. As vasopressin concentrations increase, the amplitude of the cytosolic calcium concentration spikes are not affected, but the frequency of the calcium spikes increase within a period of time, a higher frequency. This is an important property of intracellular signaling systems. If the activation process and inactivation process are very fast, activation of the signaling pathway will lead to a spike of an effector molecule within the cell, i.e. calcium, in the case of muscle contraction. If the activation and activation process is slow, the response will be graded. We will discuss this topic in more detail in the next section. So in the case of calcium, because the removal process is so fast and the activation process is so fast, you see a spike. But if the activation and inactivation process are slow, what you'll see is less of a spike, but more of a graded type of increase in concentration and decrease in concentration. All right, guys, we'll stop here and continue with the last bit in the next video. Bye.